we'll start. Um, hello and welcome. Thank you for logging on and attending today's virtual program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, please let me know if there are any technical issues I can try to resolve. Um, my colleague, Mina Jane, is also here to uh, help out with anything that you might need. Questions can be asked through the Q&A function um, and will be addressed uh, by Ashley. Uh, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, who is the past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club. She has written many books on a variety of topics and is our partner for our gardening series. Ashley will be back next week, uh, Wednesday, June 3rd at 1 p.m. with Nancy Troutman for Planting and Caring for Roses. Um, so please welcome now Ashley Rooney. Thank you, Matt. And I get to introduce Georgia Harris, who a member of our garden club, but she's been gardening for over 30 years. She is a certified master gardener, has worked in designing gardens for clients and managed a public garden. In July, she's gonna begin a new adventure as the newsletter editor of Ecological Landscape Alliance, a nonprofit that promotes sustainable ecological practices in design, construction, and land management. Today, she's gonna to talk on native plants and pollinators, one of her big interests. Georgia? Hi, Ashley. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, introducing me. And sorry I gave you such a long introduction, but you got through it well. Go <laughs> you. Um, and thank you, Carrie Library, for hosting this series. It's great to get a chance to talk to you and um, see you virtually, even though we can't see each other in person. Um, so now I would like to begin, and I am actually going to take myself off the screen so you can just enjoy my slides. And I have about a 20 minute presentation story for you. And um, if you have any questions, you can type them in your question box and we will try to answer as many of those as we can after the show. Alrighty, we ready to go? Yes. All right, here we go. All right. As quarantine stretches on longer than anyone would had anticipated, it feels like little things are growing more and more important each day. The time I spend on my porch each morning looking out into my garden with a cup of tea gives me a little escape from the out of control world around me. Similarly, in my garden, the dauntless task that arrives each and every spring, shaking off winter's decay and moving towards summer's growth can be overwhelming on a good day. Yet, as I look around my garden each day, I can't help but be drawn to something very small, but very important. The bumblebee, look at our little friend there. The soothing buzz accompanied by the familiar black and white yellow stripes, sorry, they're not white, <laughs> draws my focus from the overwhelming world that we live in today into something smaller and easier to digest. The bumblebee, he helps me focus on the here and now and gives me hope for a brighter future. In the face of endangerment, these little bees have found their way into my garden and they have found pollen and nutrients in my plants, allowing me to make a small difference in the overall scheme of things, but a big difference in the lives of these humble bees. With this talk, I hope to invite you to make a big difference in the lives of these remarkable little creatures and help you find hope in an overwhelming world. So let's take a deep breath together and figure out what we as individuals can do on our own little path of earth to foster nature, improve habitat for pollinators, butterflies, moths, and birds and all the other little creatures that work to create a healthy, beautiful, and entertaining environment for all who have the pleasure to be in the garden. So I have been, as Ashley said, I have been a gardener for lots and lots of years, but I have not always been a native gardener per se. I've gotten on board in baby steps. I became interested in planting 
more plants to attract butterflies because really, who doesn't want to have the dainty little butterflies dancing around your garden? This kind of led me down a rabbit hole and I did more and more research, research for best practices and plants to attract the most wildlife to my property, which is not large as the typical suburban land size, but hopefully it will have a big ecological impact on my garden and in my neighborhood. After attending many native plant conferences, touring several plant trial gardens and meadows, it became very clear that in order to attract pollinators and butterflies, I needed to plant native, whoops, went back too fast, sorry about that. Um, I needed to attract native species. Native pollinators have adapted both in body traits and behaviors to native, native plants. And native plants need pollinators for their health as well. They are interdependent on their life cycle. On the screen right now, we have um, a picture of some of the spring ephemerals in my garden. On the left-hand side is Virginia bluebell, and then we have the native columbine in the center and trout lily on the end. I gradually began to discover on my journey that I was missing all that nature had intended. I began to see beauty in all the seasons, not just the pretty young spring and summer seasons with all its flamboyant color and beauty. I started looking at nature, wrong way again. I'll get this, hang on guys, <laughs> sorry about that. I started looking at nature through a different lens, whether hiking around New England or just going for a walk through my neighborhood. I realized firstly, nature hates empty spaces. It will jump if given the half a chance to fill the void. And you notice in this slide, it's a picture of um, the battle road and you don't see any blank spaces. You don't see any places that are just covered with mulch. Everything is filled in with plant life. That's how nature prefers to be. Secondly, I discovered there can be a softer beauty in things once they pass their most showy stage. Perhaps this is just like us in quarantine when we haven't been to our hair salon in months and months, but we're still beautiful people, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, Ashley? <laughs> I also found that I was doing a lot of things wrong as a gardener, and I'm, I'm a professional gardener. I was cleaning my yard way too much. I was being just a little too neat and tidy. I was cutting down my perennial borders in the fall because I didn't like the look of dead leaf stalks in the winter. And here I have an example of a milk pod, um, milkweed pod um, in the fall when it's just opening and you'll um, notice the texture in that picture on the right and then in the middle of an ice storm. Now that's not green or bright and showy but it's still a, you know, very, very pretty in its own right. And here's a beautiful meadow in the early, probably November. And you notice all the, the different colors of browns and golds and that little white accent of snow, which is really, it's stunning. It's not bright spring like we're having now, but it's still beautiful. And on the right-hand side, you have berries caught in an ice storm which is also just stunningly beautiful. You just have to change your focus a little bit. The other thing that I was doing in my yard is I was using lots of bark mulch to suppress weeds. But I was doing a couple things right too. Um, I was mowing my grass pretty high and this was more out of laziness than ecological reasons and I wasn't using pesticides. So I was doing a couple things right and a couple things wrong. After I visited Longwood Meadow in Pennsylvania with this vast, vast, beautiful meadow, I decided that I would rip out my entire lawn and I'd plant a meadow too. It wasn't, wouldn't that be a good idea? Don't you think that's a great idea? Um, I sat with this idea for, for a little while and this seemed impractical, even for me. The thought of ripping out all that turf grass just made my body ache all over. 
So I decided to start small and only rip out the lawn in a couple of areas to make some borders larger and add a single um, species of native plants. Here's another beautiful picture of meadow that I wanted to have. Um, I thought I could also concentrate on an area of my yard for my meadow that was relatively unplanted. I figured this would cause minimal pain and this could be my meadow. The soil in this area was a combination of topsoil, playground sand from my daughter's younger days, and really, really large beech tree roots. Basically the perfect place to start my idea of a meadow. Um, I, I kind of refer to it as a curated meadow because it's not like one of those meadows in a can you shake and things just show up wherever they want willy nilly. I use native plants and grasses but I put them where I want them and how I would like to see them. On your screen right now, you have a picture of my meadow this spring. Um, I apologize, I couldn't find one from a couple of years ago. But you'll notice a meadow in the spring, there's not a lot going on. It's, you know, it's happiest, most florific time is in July, August, and September. But what I've done here is I have the cute little forget-me-nots kind of dancing around. Um, they are not a native, but they will self-sow themselves anywhere. And when I get tired of them or don't like them, I just rip them up. But they give me something to look at while the garden is kind of, you know, getting ready for the big show in the summer. So this is kind of my idea of nature with an ed editor. To begin my plant selection, I started with suggested native plant palettes and I researched what was appealing to me and which plants would thrive in my garden. And even though I wanted one of everything, you know how it is when you go to the store and you see all these beauties and you want to take all of them home, I decided to narrow down my plant palette while keeping it, the variety count relatively high. Remember, if you have a higher variety count, the more different insect species you can serve. I checked bloom times, seasons of interest, and compared that with what I already had in my garden. And I read every book, every blog, and listened to many webinars until I found plants that would appeal to both me and our native pollinators, butterflies, moths, birds, and of course, our lovely bumblebee. To start preparing the garden, I do not do the usual fall cleanup. I took the lazy woman's approach, which is what nature does. By leaving the leaf litter, not on your lawns, but in your perennial beds or under trees where they have fallen, you provide haven and homes for many insects who overwinter right in your garden. Even though we might not see them, next summer's butterflies and moths are hibernating right here in our leaf litter. I also did not cut down my perennial stalks. This takes a bit of getting used to as our eyes like things to look well-groomed and tended. And leaving old plant material can look very chaotic. But what you're actually doing is you provide shelter for several native bee species that make their homes in the stalks of dead plants. Now this is a picture of my meadow, um, obviously from the fall, and you can see I haven't cut anything down. Actually, I didn't cut anything down in my meadow until the temperatures rose pretty high this spring and I was seeing pollinators out buzzing about. Then I knew they had left their hibernating places and they were out in the garden. And it might look messy, but it's nature. <laughs> From a bird's eye perspective, when they are flying over your garden in the winter, if the garden has been stripped bare of plant material and leaf litter, what you're telling the birds are there are no seeds for me to eat, no shelter from predators, and certainly no insects for me to feed my young. This is not a hospitable place for me. And they just fly right over your yard and look for habitat elsewhere. Creating positive ecological impact in your garden can be as easy as letting go 
of excessive fall cleanup. I then said about, ah, I had to put my little helper Gwen in here because she's so cute and she's really kind of a little princess. She doesn't really like being outside and she's never outside very much, but sometimes it's fun to have her out there um, assisting me with my work. <laughs> um, so anyhow, um, I then said about extending three beds where there was either lawn or weeds before. None of these beds were large. One was just three by three. I planted them with native carex, crinkled hair grass, woodland phlox, and foam flower. I prepared the sites by covering the grass with cardboard to smother the weeds and the grass. I, in two of the beds, I removed the cardboard at planting time, and in the third bed, which was the most successful, I left the cardboard down. And what I, I'm doing here is I'm kind of, instead of ripping out the grass, which everybody knows can be very painful and water onerous project, I put mulch down on the grass and then I put cardboard and then I put more mulch and then I put topsoil. And when I want to plant, I leave that and kind of let it just sit for a while. And when I want to plant, I just kind of cut holes in my cardboard and stick the little roots end. Um, and this has really been very helpful for controlling weeds. It's a really easy idea. Um, with these three small beds, I created homes for over 50 new native plants. And I got them from the Native Plant Trust, which is, was formerly known as Garden in the Woods. My hope is that with these little mini habitats, will be, they will provide food for several insect and bird species and host plants for moths and butterflies. Another aspect of native gardening that you might not think about is the non-use of pesticides. The use of pesticides in the suburban urban landscape far exceeds the use of pesticides in most farms where pesticides are heavily regulated. In most suburban landscapes, the pesticide use tends to be broad-based pesticides, which basically kills every insect on your property. While when farmers use pesticides, they are trying to con kill, contain a particular pest. They're not trying to kill all pests because they know they need to protect beneficial insects. The last thing I needed to create habitat was water. And you don't need anything big, a small bird bath or two, a little shallow dish um, for some water for bees and butterflies. That's really all you need. But just like us, everything needs water. And what was remarkable with this little experiment um, was that they came. The insects, they really came. I had a fabulous summer last year. I had so many bees, moths, hummingbird moths, hummingbirds, and butterflies in my garden. What surprised me the most is that with these new pra plant practices, I saw an uptick in pollinators in a short time. I mean, that's, we're talking one garden season. That's, that's incredible. Um, I, I thought it would take years to have this kind of action in my garden, but it, it was pretty, pretty quick. Um, so kind of what this tells me is that with the loss of so much habitat, if we plant these things in our garden and don't tidy, they will come. The bees will come. They are looking for habitat and places to be. Have you noticed through this talk, I haven't told you exactly what I planted. I, I kind of made a choice in, in this presentation to tell you more about my philosophy, why I wanted to do this and what I was doing. Um, if you want a list of best native plants for the area, there's lots of resources online or books, or you can email me afterwards. But I really wanted to focus on my thought processes so you could understand what I was trying to do. And now we'll just go through some quick little slides. There's a monarch. And there is on our native ironweed. I think that's a little cabbage um, 
butterfly. I am I'm a plant person, not really a bug person, but I'm working on it. And this, I just wanted to share this slide with you. This is a picture of Shadberry um, on the right. And on the left is Carolina Silverbell. And these are both native um, ornamental trees that I have planted recently in my garden. And if you want to see them in person, Cary Library actually has a whole grove of Shadberry, Amelanchia, in the front of the library. And the Silver Bell, I believe, is in the back. So you could go see it. Um, it's finished blooming now, but go Cary. And of course, one last beautiful picture of our trilliums. Um, in no way am I suggesting that you rip out your entire lawn, but as more of our rural habitat is being developed, we need to create habitat corridors, places where nature can catch its breath for a moment and find a home or food between large open spaces and conservation lands. Farmers are planting feather areas right next to their fields to attract beneficial insects, to help alleviate the need for some pesticides and also to alleviate the cost of hiring bee colonies. States are looking to create habitats with native flowers on their highways, which reduces mowing cost, creates habitat, and is much more delightful to look at than Kentucky bluegrass, which is mostly what things are planted with now. So also must we as landowners find ways to build hope into our landscapes. We are not powerless, we, we, we can do this. And really this is an exciting time. We can make a difference in our town, in our county, and in our state. And we can get creative in our own gardens and move away from that ideal of house, foundation plants, green lawns. That's not what it has to look like on every single house, on every single street. We could plant native plants, native grasses to soften the edges near sidewalks. We could plant a winter berry outside of our window. So when the fruit becomes ripe, in the winter and the birds are stopping by for a delicious snack, you can sit back in your window and be warm and enjoy watching the birds have a tasty meal. And we could do away from mulch areas almost entirely because mulch with no plants and no leaf litter doesn't provide anything for anyone. And bark mulch doesn't break down quickly. It doesn't provide nutrients for plants and can change the pH in your soil. When you do need to use mulch, use shredded leaf litter or plant annuals to hold weeds at bay until your perennials get big enough to just take over the whole garden. Partridge pea is a perfect example of a native um, annual that you could just throw some seeds in and it could take um, the place until the perennials get tall. We need to pull our eyes away from the old idea of what beauty in the landscape means. We need to embrace all the seasons of the plant cycle, not just the loud ones that yell, look at me, but the seasons that are more browns, grays, and golds, the seed heads and the flower stalks, as well as the flowers. We can create pollinator corridor, corridors and create habitat and do just a little bit to save the world. The list of must-haves is really, really very simple. We need to plant native plants, preferably not cultivars, and we need to have plants that bloom for multiple seasons. We need water, everything needs water on this planet, and everything shouldn't be neat and tidy. A little mess is really best. We need to plant host plants for caterpillar foods, and we need to not use pesticides. Remember, nature is the closest thing that we have to perfection. Remember, nature can solve many of the problems that we are currently experiencing, except possibly COVID-19, but neither here nor there. Um, we just need to give nature a little helping hand. And this other thing, remember insects are really good at turning things around as they are really, really great in reproducing. And I will end with a quote from Shikma Rao. When the flower blossoms, 
the bee will come. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ashley. And now if we have any questions, I will. We're gonna break them. I have a couple of questions, but boy, was this beautiful. Oh, thank you. It was, it was so nice to just see this lovely oasis of beautiful, gorgeous pictures. Um, a lot of people ask me about having a native garden. Mm -hmm. They want everything neat and tidy. Yes. How can they accomplish that neat and tidy desire? Which I don't think fits with a native garden. But uh, it, it can. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things that you can do. One thing um, that you'll notice when a garden is mulched, say, you know, it's the reason that that looks so neat is it's all one color and then you're seeing green. Right. Well, you can kind of create that by creating the edge of the bed and mulch the edge so you have a line. Our, our eyes like to see lines. So if you have either put rocks or edging, if you create some sort of line between the your native um, plantings and your grass or something else, you can create that nice visual line that gives the eye a rest and then um, have it a little wild. And if you still don't, you know, it's like, ah, that's just too much for me, then maybe let the back part of your bed be a little wilder. It's, it's, it's not that one is, well, the paper one is not great, but it's training your eye to have a different ideal of what beauty is. Right. As you said, now that we're going without hair salons, we're all yes. a different type of beauty. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. Uh, Ashley and Georgia, before you continue, um, do you want to uh, take shut off the presentation and have you both be on camera? Sure. Or? sure. Okay. Um, Jamie would like to know, what about bunnies and other animals and birds who like to eat seeds and leaves? Um, hang on a second. I'm trying to take off the presentation. Do I just do that? Oh, there we go. Okay. There she is. Now everybody can see Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jamie's Are question. Interested? What about bunnies and other animals and birds who like to eat seeds and leaves? Okay, so I haven't had a lot of problems with the birds eating the seeds. Um, and usually there's enough seeds to kind of go around. The bunnies are a huge issue. And um, I'm not sure what happened to our coyote population, but they are not doing their job. I just want you to know that. <laughs> um, for bunnies, I have tried several different things. Um, I actually ordered some spray um, online during our little COVID adventure here. And that's a peppermint oil and it works really well. I also use cages, um, but I also, unless I really, really love the plant, I am trying not to plant things that bunnies like. So I have no echinacea in my garden anymore because bunnies just have annihilated it. Um, <laughs> I found in the last question of uh, last week when we talked about bunnies, I use cages also, but there are many, there's a whole bunch of flowers that bunnies do not go near. They don't like things that smell. They don't like the cochiana, allium, tulips. Um, they don't like any of the mints, any of the bee bombs or right. coleopsis. Um, there's a lot of things that they, a lot of things they do eat and a lot of things they don't eat. And I am trying to not have them eat all my precious stuff. <laughs> right. Or, <laughs> or you can take your precious plant that you really want to do and surround it by uh, plants that are not palatable to a bunny rabbit. And that will also protect it somewhat. Um, there's another way of doing it. Um, I have a butterfly bush in my pollinator garden. It always has lots of butterflies in its bloom. So do I need to do anything more to have a pollinator garden? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, Ashley, because butterfly bushes are um, they're actually not native. They're from Asia and they are lovely. They have a lovely scent. They're very, you know, they're pretty much guaranteed to bloom. Um, but in places further south, they are also becoming invasive. 
Mm -hmm. um, and if you will notice in my slide, I did have um, pictures of the butterfly. Some of them were on the butterfly bush because butterfly bush is kind of like crack for butterflies. They really, really like it. And sometimes they're not pollinating the native things that really provide more nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say if you love one plant one, but as global warming keeps coming up, they may become invasive up here. And like in England, I don't know if you've been to England recently, but butterfly bushes are so invasive. They're in railroad tracks and, and it's kind of pretty, but they are everywhere. So it's kind of like the kudzu of London. So yeah. we need to plant other things that are native, yeah. which is not a butterfly bush. That's sad. Butterfly bushes can become our burning bush. Oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, from Peter, are you aware of any effort to obtain a National Wildlife Federation Community Habitat designation for Lexington? We would love to get involved. Do you know anything about that? I don't. I do not. That that's, sounds very interesting. I, I No, I don't. Uh, Peter, I think you should pursue that further. Uh, probably write it into the Garden Club on their website or the Facebook. And let's see if we can look it up and see what else is going on on that one. So uh, we will try to investigate further and get back to you. From Sari, I am trying to build beds, but one can only go so quickly. Is there anything that is not mulch that can be used to keep the weeds back a bit? Um, so I would uh, try leaf mulch. And actually, I just noticed Wagon Wheel is delivering leaf mulch now. Um, they, it's new this year. And there's a company in Waltham that also will deliver leaf mulch. Also, you can put in annuals. Um, partridge pea is one of the few native animals, or animals. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> annuals. And you can just throw some seed down and put some of that in. or. And even though they're not native, they are beautiful and they're annual. Um, Cosmos, um, Chelone, um, not Chelone, um, spider flower. What is the name for that? Cleome. Cleome. Cleome, yeah. So there's several um, really quick going and growing annuals that you can throw in and will take the place of mulch until your perennials get bigger. Because, you know, if you have a four by four bed, that's a lot of perennials, you know, it takes yeah. them a while to fill it up. Oh, it does. And the mixture, I think, of perennials and then some annuals in the middle to give you constant color if you want during the summer is very nice. Yes. Okay, Siri also wants to know, also, do I understand correctly that it is residential use of pesticides that has a larger footprint than what farmers use on farms? You do understand that. Yes. Our, we are not regulated. The, you know, um, mow and blow companies are not regulated to how much pesticides they can put on each lawn and every single person on my street could use the pesticides where farmers are regulated. They have to have a specific pesticide for a specific pest and that's what they're going after. I mean, I think farmers are also different because they're out there every day and they've seen long term the effects of broad band pesticides, you know, DDT and stuff like that. So yes, you do understand that correctly. And matter of fact, we had a bee person come to speak at the garden club about two years ago. And he said that the bees in Boston on the rooftops of Boston are a lot safer than they are out here because of the pesticides. Yep. And they're doing a lot better in Boston than they are out here, which is really sad when you think of we have all the green and the flowers and so forth, but that's what they want to know. Yeah, and, and pesticides and bees are not, they're, they're not friends. <laughs> yeah, they are far from it. Elaine would like to know, what can we do to promote milkweed growth? Um, milkweed um, is the host plant for the monarch butterfly in case, um, you, uh, the listeners um, weren't aware. Um, and the monarch butterfly does not uh, obviously overwinter here in New England, but migrates from Mexico. Um, what can we do? I think we just need to talk about it more. And, um, you know, a lot of native plants have the name weed in them. Joe pie weed, milkweed, butterfly weed. Mm -hmm. And we don't tend to have the same respect for them as we do 
peony, rose. And so I think, first of all, we need to respect the plants a little more. Um, and how can we promote milkweed? I don't know, maybe the garden club, maybe Ashley, we could have a campaign to promote them um, or, you know, contact a native nursery and get a bunch of plant um, plugs and hand them out to our neighbors. Um, once you have milkweed in your garden, you have it. I mean, I have milkweed and the thing about a native garden is plants move around. So my garden is never static. I had milkweed over in this back garden and now it's in the front garden and I don't mind that. I'm like, okay, you want to be there. So um, again, I think it's letting go of complete control. We have no control over anything anymore, including where our milkweed is. You have an interesting point. Maybe we should give away milkweed at Arbor Day as opposed to a little pine tree. I mean, something yeah. we could bring up at the garden club. Yeah. Maybe in Willard's Woods has a lot of milkweed. Somebody planted it there way back. Maybe we could do that in some of the other conservation land and be possible there. Uh, I've got other questions here. Oh, I had a problem with this one. Jamie says, how does one persuade neighbors that bees are a good thing versus being a danger to children? My neighbor was not happy when I put in bees. Ah. Um, well, generally, so, you know, I've been gardening since the 90s. I have only run into a bee problem one time, and it was I invaded their house, and they got a little mad. Um, bees don't want to sting people. That is not their end goal. They, you know, they're, if they're honeybees, if they're beehives, they want to go out and collect pollen and bring it back to the hive. And they're pretty docile, sweet little creatures. And unless you bother them, they won't bother you. Um, I, I think it's just education. I think um, one thing I have done with my neighborhood during, um, when I've been at home for so long, I, um, I thought, well, why don't we try to create a pollinator corridor, corridor on our own street? So I sent out a letter to a bunch of the neighbors and I'm like, here's a list of plants. You can plant one or three. I will get the plants for you, deliver them to you, and we can plant them. And you can plant them all in the same day, socially distancing, of course. <laughs> um, so I, I, I just think it's more education and not saying, you know, having people come around to it rather than like dictating what they should do. You kind of introduce them like, oh, this is my thinking and this is why I'm doing that. Um, I always think that works better than kind of being, you know, I want bees. <laughs> yeah, well, in my case, when my neighbor, I had the beehive on her side of the property and she was very unhappy because she had children. I moved it to the other side of the property. So I still have the bees. Her kids still come and look at the bees. They're fascinated by the bees. Everything's fine. No one's gotten stung. Everybody's happy. It's trying to be, uh, George is right, trying to figure out how to work a nice compromise and still have your bees. And yes, they need a home here. Um, anything you can do for them, I would really recommend. We'll have the Interfaith Garden on in a couple of weeks. And she has many, many bees. There are five hives there. Um, i got to shut my thing off. Um, we have a, another one here. Do you have any recommendations for shaded area perennials? in a forest area of pines yeah, that will take. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so there's lots of, um, first of all, lots of um, ephemerals that could work under there, which are um, one of the plants that um, New England has the most ephemerals of any place in the world, fun fact, in case that comes up on some sort of Pictionary or something or Trivial Pursuit. Uh, that we're all playing while we're locked inside. Um, so like Virginia Bluebell, Trillium, Mary Bells, Mayapple. So several ephemerals would be a good idea. Also um, Bugbane is also a nice one. I'm not sure, you know, if you have room for big tall plants, um, Goat's Beard. Um, and I'm saying all the common names here. I thought that would be easier. Um, what are some others? Oh, um, the native bleeding heart is also lovely. Um, 
You could also plant, there's a lot of native azaleas if you wanted kind of a shrub border. Also the native red twig dogwoods if you want a shrub border. So there's, there's so many possibilities for the shade area. Yeah, I would go talk to um, one of the big nurseries and they will give you recommendations too um, of things you can do there. It is d difficult with the pines. Pines um, are a way of upsetting the plants. It, it is also, it's interesting. Um, I have my blueberries under my pines and they love the acid. And how I take care of them is I just rake all the pine needles and that's their mulch. And I have huge blueberry crops, which I, you know, sounds kind of strange. Do you have sun? We have a little bit of sun, but not very much. Oh, that's interesting because I think a blueberry is needing much more sun. Yeah. You would think, but I don't have yeah. a lot of sun. <laughs> I would plant blueberries then, because that's lovely to have. Blueberries are a good New England crop. Yes. Um, raspberries. Raspberries also can take that d um, dappled light if it's a little dappled. Yeah, that could work. Uh, do you have any recommendations for beehive professionals? I prefer not to uh, name names on public TV, because if I leave somebody out, somebody's going to get hurt. There are several in Lexington who are certainly here that can be um, happy to help you. Um, I wanted to add a couple more about, I did a little research too um, on this pesticide question because a lot of people say, well, I have to use methaladine or this or Roundup. And my question is, what are you trying to kill? What are you, are you I mean, we- Aphids on my roses. And I'm thinking, oh, oh okay. <laughs> 14 of the 30 most commonly used lawn pesticides are known neurotoxins or carcinogens. And two thirds of them cause reproductive harm in humans. And given how much cancer there is, I think we all should sort of take a look at that. You know, when you think of how many women do get cancer, how many men get cancer, there is a lot of use of pesticides. We've got happily sprayed everything in existence and it's beginning to affect us and we should need to think about it. Um, so I definitely recommend what George is saying on that. Georgia, I have a, one other worry. Um, I have a friend with a native garden. She lets the jewelweed go and she says, but jewelweed is native. It is native. And you know, we just take it over that garden, and I'm like, we can't use this. Um, well, but it is, you know, as opposed to having roses or peonies or something else there, it does provide nectar for butterflies and bees. Um, do you want it all over your garden? Possibly not. I wouldn't. Um, I, oh, I, if I have some, I keep it contained. Um, like I said, nature with an editor. Um, and there are certain things that even if they're, na um, they're native, if I don't like them, I, I, I don't plant them. Because I, I am trying to plant a garden that I like to look at and that is natural. Um, but she is right. It is a native plant. Um, but do you want to, your entire garden to look like? I mean, that to me gets a little too weedy. And I, I don't mind messy, but I don't want weedy. <laughs> I would agree. I mean, how do you, you keep it within limits. Um, it's like the, the garlic mustard. You have to pull that out eventually because it's going to take over. Yes, yes. Um, and so, that's an invasive that we're having to deal with. Right. Um, and it's a good thing to do with these days when you're walking, and I see so many people on the bike path walking, yeah. pull up the garlic mustard on their way. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we didn't talk much about fertilizers, which my resources said do not use fertilizers um, with this kind of planting. Do you have more to say about that? So, um, so most, if you're planting kind of like prairie and native plants, um, they don't want that rich garden soil. Um, I might give them a little compost tea and when I first plant them and I certainly do water them the first year and if we're having 100 degree temperatures I water them but other than that I'm kind of like you guys gotta be strong and fend for yourselves so I do not fertilize them they need lots of them need poor soil and the one reason my meadow works where it is there's a lot of sand there from when my girls had their sandbox 
So it is, it drains very quickly and it's not very organic. And what I, by leaving the plants all winter, all that organic material is just composing and going down into the soil. So I don't feed it um, just like it wouldn't get fed in nature. So no, I do not fertilize. Fertilizer is also way over consumed by mm -hmm. homeowners. We don't need to put, because most of the fertilizer does not stay on your property, especially if you're in wetlands or something, it just drains off or it drains into the, the sewer and the water system and then it goes into the harbor and then it causes algae blooms in the ocean. So no, I do not use fertilizer. Nicely said. <laughs> and if you, if, uh, wait, if you go, go back and explain compost tea in case somebody doesn't know what that is. So compost tea, um, you can make, it's, it's um, I compost all my um, food scraps and you can just kind of make a little tea with it. Um, I can use eggshells or something else, um, or you can also buy it um, um, liquid fertilizer in a garden store, but I, I kind of let it sit in water um, and create kind of a tea. Um, I let it sit for a really long time and then I'll have like a jar, a, a mason jar full of it. And then I will add it to like a gallon of water and I will, especially if I plant a new tree or a new bush, I will give it a little. little, yeah, little compost. yeah. This is, that's a good thing. And if you don't have your own compost, you can always get it up at Hartwell Composting Facility. Yeah. They have beautiful compost. We have about one final question. Do you have a recommendation for vines to go over a fence? Oh, well, um, we do have a native honeysuckle, um, not the Japanese one, but a native one. And um, they're lovely and they attract lots of hummingbirds. I have three or four hummingbirds that come to my yard every um, year. Um, I'm not sure how sturdy the fence post is, but also um, climbing hydrangea is another one, but it needs a pretty strong um, structure to hold it up. Um, I would probably go with more of, of also trumpet vine is another native vine. Um, but, um, and Virginia creeper, again, some people might think that's a weed, is a, a lovely vine that actually provides lots of beneficial food for birds in the winter, but it's not flowering. So I'm not sure that would fit your bill. Yeah, people usually like a flowering over their fence. Yeah, something yeah. Something like that. Uh, and you mentioned the Native Plant Trust and that's in Framingham, Massachusetts, yeah. if anybody's looking for that. Um, and Ashley? Yes? We have one more question. Somebody has their hand raised. I'm gonna let them ask it aloud, if that's okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I take our chances. I can't Joe. Oh, she's muted. Hello. Am I the one more question? You yeah, are. I have one question, Joe. <laughs> I have one question. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. There has been a difference of opinion about whether or not one can compost certain um, ubiquitous weeds. For hmm. example, I'm of the opinion if you put, pile it high and wide and leave it for a long time, eventually the garlic, garlic mustard or whatever else it is will go the way of all dirt. There are others who say that has to be bundled and thrown in the trash in order to get rid of it. Do you have an opinion about that? Georgia, we want to take that? Sure, um, I am of the camp bundle it and throw it away. Your compost is never going to get hot enough to kill those seeds and to kill that plant. And they're invasive for a reason. And even um, the compost facility at Hartwell does not want you adding that to your yard waste. They want you to put it in a bag, a black paper bag and throw it away. Black plastic? I yeah. heard it was plastic as well. So yeah, it doesn't. I guess it doesn't matter what kind of <laughs> plastic, but yeah. It has to go in your it has to go in your garbage. Yes. 
because otherwise it spreads. Yes. Um, and it's what our civic um, stewards have told us me also. Uh, will there be, oh, Jamie, thank you, Jamie. This was wonderful. Will there be a recording available to share with neighbors? Mina, are you there? Are you wanna answer that? Uh, I can That's answer here. that. Yeah, we're, we're recording this, so it will be on um, YouTube either later today or tomorrow. Super, and you'll send us a copy. That'll be great, yep. or a, a link. Um, so I want to thank Georgia for being here in this difficult time. It's lovely to have this oasis of beauty and this sort of avenue of hope that she's pointing out of things that we can do that can make life better, can bring some beauty back into our, our lives that we're not worrying so much. I mean, the idea of these pesticides creating so much cancer is very terrifying for any of those of us who've had cancer and you think, oh my, so what we can do is very important. We don't have to feel, we just have to roll over and give it, go with it. We can fight back and we can plant the milkweed. We can have the bees coming back, flying around and we can have that moment of beauty in our yards. I thank you all for coming. See you all next week. Thank you so much, Ashley, for inviting me. I really